I started reading the Bible, but I just got lost in all the genealogy. You know, who begot who. Who was Melchizedek? Where'd he come from? The book of Revelation just scares me. I mean, does anybody really understand all those symbols? Who are the judges? Like, do they really matter? I've never understood which book came first. Is there a way to read the Bible so it makes sense? Welcome to our Father's Plan. It's good to have you with us. I'm Jeff Cavins, along with Dr. Scott Hahn, who teaches at Franciscan University, currently teaching there as an associate professor of theology and scripture studies. It's good to have you with us. Good to be here. We are in the midst of a study of Scripture, and uh, if you just joined us on this series, what we're doing is we're taking a look at the Bible, we're learning how to read the Bible in chronological order, we're looking at some of the major themes of the Bible, and uh, Dr. Hahn is doing just a magnificent job of uh, sharing these themes with us as we read through the Scripture, and uh, I'm sure that, uh, that you'll benefit for, by staying tuned. In our last show, what we talked about was the, uh, the period of Israel in Egypt. And while they were in Egypt, some interesting events took place, particularly in Exodus chapter 32, which I might just add for our viewers who just joined us, we're in the book of Exodus right now. We started out in Genesis, we're moving on to Exodus, and then we're going to be moving on to Numbers. But let's review just a little bit about the book of Exodus, particularly chapter 32 and the, the golden calf incident. Yeah, the golden calf episode in Exodus 32 is really the hinge on which the whole Mosaic Covenant turns. Before the golden calf, Israel was God's firstborn son nation. And because they were his firstborn son, they had a kind of royal priestly mission among all the other nations of the world, like younger brothers who looked to their older brother for a role model. So God the Father called Israel to be that sort of, sort of role model for the nations. And, and that was the purpose for bringing Israel out of Egypt, to covenant himself to them and send them out with this mission to bring him and his truth to the nations. But all of that was shattered at the golden calf. Mm -hmm. Before that, all 12 tribes had priestly privileges. After the golden calf, none of them did. They were all defrocked because the Levites got it instead. And the reason the Levites did is because they didn't worship the calf. They drew their swords at Moses' command and slaughtered 3,000 of the calf worshipers. Moses awarded them with the priesthood, in a sense, stripping it away from every tribe, every family, every father, every firstborn son, and all the other 12 tribes of Israel, causing a kind of revolutionary reconfiguration of Israel's structure, of their social and religious polity. From Exodus 32 and the golden calf onward, then, we have a whole new covenant. We have the covenant renewed through Moses and Aaron and the Levites. So God now, in a sense, establishes buffer zones, mm -hmm. greater degrees of mediation, greater distance between himself and those 12 tribes. First in Aaron, the high priest. Second in the Levites. Third in the tabernacle. Fourth in the animal sacrifices that represent the daily repudiation of the idols of Egypt, as we saw last time. Cattle, sheep, and goats had to be sacrificed. Not coincidentally, those were the three animals that the Egyptians had been worshiping as their gods. And apparently, from Joshua 24, Ezekiel 20, and Exodus 8:26, as we saw last time, we learned that Israel had become infected during their 400-year stay in Egypt by this idolatrous sin. And so God couldn't break them immediately at Sinai. Instead, it became a very slow, painful process. And that really explains all the complicated ceremonies at the end of Exodus, but we also saw last time that it really explains the complicated laws of Leviticus. Mm -hmm. Look at Leviticus, divide it in half. The first half, Leviticus 1 to 16, is the priestly code, the handbook for the new priests in Israel, the Levites. They read that, they know what they're supposed to do in terms of the sacrifices they're to administer. The second half of Leviticus, 17 to 27, that's the guide 
guidebook that the Levites are to give to the 12 tribes to rehabilitate them, ultimately to restore them more back to the Lord so that perhaps they could have their royal priestly privileges restored. Who knows? We talked about earlier in the book of Genesis, in, uh, Genesis 3.15, the Proto-Evangelium, the mm -hmm. first uh, pronouncement of the gospel, uh, that God's desire is that the whole world really be blessed and brought into this family. How does this golden calf incident uh, play into that? Well, as I said last time, what Adam is to all human beings, their progeny, you know, his progeny, Israel is to all the nations. He is the firstborn son of God. Mm -hmm. Israel is the firstborn nation. When Adam sinned, it brought corruption, original sin upon us all. When Israel sinned, it brought great corruption and confusion among the nations. The rabbis used to say that what the forbidden fruit was to Adam, the golden calf was to Israel. But God can't just simply forget about Israel. You see, because Israel is Abraham's natural seed, and because they're Abraham's seed, God who bound himself to Abraham by oath in Genesis 22, cannot really forsake Abraham's progeny, just as he wouldn't forsake Adam's race mm -hmm. either. So God has bound himself to the whole race, the whole family of Adam, and God has bound himself also to the whole seed of Abraham. And so though Abraham's seed, Israel, is stained with sin, and though God would have a justifiable cause to separate himself from them forever, he won't because he's bound by covenant oath to them, and he bound himself by covenant oath mm -hmm. because he foresaw their sin and thus made provisions in advance according to his wisdom and mercy, downloading into the covenant program the provisions that would ultimately bring Israel back to God and so that God could use Israel ultimately to bring all the nations back into his family as well. Okay, we, we're at the Golden Calf Incident, Exodus 32. Up to this point, it seems like a streamlined program. Suddenly, there's a bump in the road. Things become very, very, <laughs> yeah. a major bump in the road. Things become very complex in the plan of God. Where are we going to move out from here now? Well, as a result of the complexity, there is a kind of bicovenantal constitution now in Israel put in place after the calf. The bicovenantal constitution is a covenant between God and the Levites, administered by Moses, and another covenant between the Levites and the 12 tribes. And that covenant is really what Leviticus is all about. But from this point on, we have a year-long stay. Israel had an extra long stay at Sinai in order for all of this reconfiguration to work. And then after that year-long stay, they set out to the Promised Land. But as you're going to explain in a few minutes, it took a good extra 40 years to get there. That's interesting. We're going to pick up then in the book of Numbers, because the book of Numbers is the, is the next book for us to study, and we'll be taking a look at that in a minute. But you know, as you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, the, the devastation that's brought on by sin, the, how sin separates us in our relationship to God, and, and I, this isn't any different today, is it? No, it's not. It's really not. And yet, throughout the sin, and along with the punishment, always comes a message of hope, rooted and grounded That's in good. divine mercy, but not just in an arbitrary mercy, but a mercy that God extends to us by His own sworn oath. He pledges His life to us and ultimately gives that life to us so that we might live for Him. That's good. You know, it reminds me, later on in, in the, uh, the show, not this show, but in the subsequent shows, we're going to be talking about the Catholic Church and how this all fits in. I'm excited. I can't wait yeah, to, can't to get a hold of that. Good. Uh, as we move into the, the book of Numbers, and uh, we're going to do that in just a few minutes, is there anything that we need to, to look out for? Is there anything that we need to kind of look for as far as rumble strips? Yeah, rumble strips are the things that cars drive over yeah. as they're coming up to a Wake toll. Wake you up. Pay. Yeah. <laughs> I've driven over a few when I was half asleep myself. Uh, yeah, I would say three things. First, in Numbers 1 to 10, there is an elaborate uh, ritual of uh, census taking. Actually, three censuses are taken in Numbers 1 to 10. First, the 12 tribes are numbered. Second, all the Levites are numbered. And third, all the firstborn are numbered, so that what the firstborn once had before the calf is taken away and given to the Levites. Okay. And in the process of that year-long stay, described in Numbers 1 to 10, 
All 12 tribes have to kind of relearn a new mm -hmm. covenant way with the Lord. Then from Numbers 11 all the way to 21, we have the, the wanderings for 40 years in the wilderness, which we'll get into. Mm -hmm. But from Numbers 22 on all the way to 36, the, the closing part of Numbers, there we have a catastrophic scene where Israel is perched on the plains of Moab right on the brink of the promised land where the second generation is about to commit an act of apostasy as worse, as bad as the first generation's worship of the golden calf. Sounds exciting to look into. Join us on this scripture reading. We're going to be back in just a, a couple of minutes and uh, encourage you to open your Bible up to the book of Numbers. We're going to take a few minutes, explain the book of Numbers, sort of the, uh, some of the, the, the highlights, and then we'll be back with Dr. Hahn to discuss some very critical issues during the book of Numbers. We'll be back with our Father's plan in just a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to our Father's Plan. Well, we gave you a little bit of a taste by talking to Dr. Han about the book of Numbers, which is the book that we're about to delve into. We still are in the period called Israel in Egypt. On your timeline band, that's the tan bead. And this is the period where Israel is traveling in the wilderness. We're going to take a look at that in just a moment. If you'd like to, to uh, uh, get a hold of your own Bible timeline band with instructions on how to read through the Bible, you can just write to EWTN or call, and they'll let you know how you can obtain this. Inside you get a complete uh, package, how to read through the Bible. It even gives you a read through the Bible in three months program. You can read through the Bible historically in chronological order. It's exciting. It's an adventure. Well, we move into our next book and that's the book of Numbers, an exciting book. As Dr. Han just explained to you, the children of Israel have been at Mount Sinai and they had to spend an extra year at Mount Sinai due to the golden calf incident. After a year at Mount Sinai, the children of Israel break camp. It's time to head north and take the promised land. You remember back in Genesis chapter 12 with Abraham when God promised to Abraham land for his descendants. And that uh, covenant that uh, assured the land took place with Moses. Well, now it's time to head north and it's time to take the land. And uh, this is not that far of a journey, really, but we're going to find out that this becomes about a 40-year journey for the children of Israel. They break camp and they head north. And they stop at a place called Kadesh Barnea. It's an interesting name. The name Kadesh Barnea comes from the Hebrew word Kadosh, which means holy. Literally speaking, the name Kadesh Barnea means a place of separation. The term Kadosh or holy means to be separate, to be separate from, from the world. And Kadesh Barnea for the children of Israel is a place where they camp, and it's a place of separation. Are they going to go on with God into the land, or are they going to backpedal? Well, they send 12 spies into the land. The 12 spies go up into the land, they search out the land, and they come back. Ten of the spies said, there's no way that we can take that land. There's giants in the land. But two, Joshua and Caleb said, we most certainly can take the land. God is with us, we can take the land. You've probably been in committee meetings before majority ruled, and they decided that they weren't going to go into the land. And here's what God did. God responded by saying that you are up in the land for 40 days spying it out. Now, those who are 20 years old and over will die in the wilderness, and you will spend 40 years in the wilderness a year for every day you are up in that land looking at that land. And you denied the land, and you denied my power and my ability to bring you in to the land. Well, the book of Numbers is largely the 40 years. It's a, it really covers the 40 years of the wanderings in the desert. And there's a lot of interesting events that take place uh, during this time, and we can talk about some of those with Dr. Hahn. At the end of the 40-year period, the children of Israel find themselves on the eastern shores or the eastern side of the Jordan River. Uh, they're ready to cross in to the land of Canaan. They are camped at a place called the Plains of Moab. Forty years have gone by. They're waiting to take the land that was promised clear back there to Abraham. And they're no doubt excited. They have conquered a couple of uh, very formidable foes and the kings on the eastern side of the Jordan and they're ready to take the land. The king of Moab, Balak, 
is very nervous about Israel hanging around. And so what he does is he hires a real high-profile prophet by the name of Balaam. And he hires Balaam to come in and put a curse on Israel. Balaam comes down and he tries to put a curse on Israel, and he can't. He can't put a curse on Israel, but he blesses Israel. Balak is very frustrated, but Balaam comes up with a plan. If he cannot put a curse on Israel, why not get Israel to really trip themselves up? And so here's the plan. Balaam says, why don't you get the children of Israel to get involved in the cult rituals of Moab? And so that's what happens. And it's known as the sin of Baal of Peor. The sin of Baal of Peor. As a result of this sin, the children of Israel, their relationship with the Lord is once again ruptured. Now this is going to be the thrust of what Dr. Hahn and I are going to talk about in a few minutes. This is where the book of Deuteronomy comes in at this point. The book of Deuteronomy is given right before the children of Israel cross the Jordan. We're going to talk in our next program about the conquest of Canaan and how the children of Israel actually took the land. But we're going to park here on the plains of Moab for a little bit, and we're going to delve into the book of Deuteronomy. Once again, if you're reading with us through the Bible, we've covered Genesis, we're through Exodus, and now we're heading on to the book of Numbers. Look at my chart just for a moment here, and I'll show you what I'm talking about. Of the 14 historical books that we're reading through to get the chronological big picture of Bible history, Genesis is the first one, Exodus is the second one, and you and I are about now ready to head into the book of Numbers. Remember when we talked about the book of Leviticus? The book of Leviticus takes place right after Exodus chapter 32, and that is the golden calf incident. Dr. Hahn just explained that to us. So we'll be back in just a couple of minutes and get your Bible out, open up to the book of Numbers, and we're going, and also to the book of Deuteronomy. We're going to uh, delve into this and uh, find out a little bit more about our Father's plan. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Welcome back to our Father's Plan. Genesis, Exodus, now it's Numbers. Dr. Hahn, welcome back. Where do we come up with the name Numbers? Well, the book of Numbers is named Numbers because of the numbering that takes place twice, actually, at the beginning and near the end. In Numbers chapters 1 to 7, the first generation is numbered in a three-part census. You have the 12 tribes first, then you have the firstborn sons numbered, and then finally you have the Levites numbered. And it isn't always clear as to why this first census takes place, but if you look closely, you'll see that it's for God to take from the firstborn sons the priesthood they forfeited at the golden calf and to install the Levites as substitutes in their place. Now, the book of Numbers closes in chapter 26 with a second census there. It's not quite the end of the book. It ends in 36. But in 26, you have a numbering or a census being taken 40 years later with the second generation, right after they've committed an act of apostasy, every bit as serious as the golden calf episode involving the first generation. And so in both cases, the censuses that are taken are demotions in a sense. In the first case, the, the first generation of 12 tribes are demoted from this royal priestly status they had. And then after 40 years of God beckoning the second generation to learn from their natural father's mistakes and come back to their, to their covenant father, to the Lord. He gives them a test on the plains of Moab mm -hmm. after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And they fail that test just like their fathers failed it back at Sinai. And as a result of the failure in Numbers 25, a second census is taken in 26, mm -hmm. whereby those 12 tribes are re-demoted <laughs> back to that subordinate status under the Levites again. So let me get this straight. In, in Exodus 32, we have the golden calf incident, and as a result of that, the, uh, the children of Israel, the, the plan is sort of uh, scrambled at that point. Forty years go by, those are the, wandering, the wilderness wandering years, and that moves us up to Numbers 25, where we have like a second failure. That's right. In a certain sense, God is relating to Israel like a father relates to a rebellious son. And in this case, not just a rebellious son, but a rebellious son who's involved in some criminal activities. Hmm. Israel is 
is put on probation, as it were. And the Levites become sort of like the father's legal guardians for the child, for the son, for the, for the rebellious minor. Mm -hmm. Or you could also look up, uh, upon them as sort of like the probationary officer appointed by the court to administer the terms of probation. Now, originally, that was only going to be a temporary thing. After the golden calf, the Levites are installed. The 12 tribes are demoted. There is a clergy the tribe of Levi, a mm -hmm. priestly caste, then there are laity. The 12 tribes are, in a sense, laicized. And that is apparently, if you're looking closely at the narrative, only meant to be a remedial design. Its ultimate purpose is to restore the 12 tribes back to the original calling they had as God's firstborn son, to royal priesthood. But you mentioned Kadesh Barnea. The, uh, the first generation really fails miserably as they're perched, ready to enter the promised land, the 10 spies come back and convince them that it's all a trap. And so they refuse to enter the inheritance that God had sworn to give them as Abraham's seed. And 40 years of probationary wandering are decreed, whereby the first generation is disinherited. That's sort of like their restitution. But the purpose is not only punitive. It isn't simply designed to punish the first generation, the parents who came out of Egypt. It's also designed to to rehabilitate the second generation. Didn't work though, did it? It didn't. The children under 30 have 40 years to unlearn the mistakes of their parents. Mm. And there in Numbers 25 on the plains of Moab, we discover they never did. <laughs> Sin travels down the generations. It's so hard yeah. to make a break from the parents. You know, I sit and I chuckle over that myself and I think, how could they do that? But yeah. then I, look, I look at my own life <laughs> and I do the same thing. Well, I'll exactly. go on. Let's get, let's get into the Numbers 25. Yeah, Numbers 25, we could spend a lot of time on that, but I think okay. it's enough just simply to say there they are on the plains of Moab when uh, an event takes place. Uh, the event is the Israelite men yoke themselves to Baal of Peor. Mm -hmm. But this is more than just idolatry. It's also sexual immorality. Mm -hmm. Numbers 25, 1 to 10, describes how in the presence of Moses and all the elders, one Israelite man takes this Midianite woman into his tent, not merely to fornicate, but apparently to practice some idolatrous rituals mm -hmm. connected to their sexual immorality. And as a result, Moses, you know, is given this command by the Lord to, to, to uh, punish all of the judges, to hang the chiefs of Israel in the sun, a punishment which apparently never is administered. Instead, while everybody's weeping and wailing, Phinehas, Aaron's grandson, sees this Israelite man taking this Midianite woman into his tent, mm -hmm. looks at all these elders, looks at Moses, they're all sobbing and repenting and wailing, but none of them are lifting a finger to actually obey what the Lord stipulated. So just impulsively, with this righteous indignation, Phinehas takes his spear, follows the couple into the tent, and thrusts the spear right through them both in flagrante delecto, we could say. <laughs> and as a result of this action, you're wondering, you know, what is God going to do to Phinehas now? Well, the startling response of the Lord is, Moses, go tell Phinehas that I am going to establish with him and his generations a covenant of peace and a covenant of perpetual priesthood so that it will only be through the line of Phinehas. Now, Phinehas that, is a Levite? That's right. Phinehas is not just a Levite. He is descended. He's related to Aaron. He is okay. Aaron's grandson. Now, Aaron had originally had four sons, two of whom died, two are left. Okay. But only one of them now, Phinehas, is going to be the ironic line through which the high priest will be named. It seems to be getting on. narrower and narrower. Yeah, that's often what the Lord has to do in response to the majority, which often wanders away from the demands of holiness. Huh. Yeah, and so here in Numbers 25, the Phineas Covenant is established, whereby the Levites are reinstalled through Phineas, their new head, Aaron's grandson over the 12 tribes. So what apparently had been only a temporary, remedial, probationary, 40-year uh, institution is going to become something permanent. Mm -hmm. And the permanent institution of the lay, uh, of the, uh, the 12 lay tribes being under the Levites is what we refer to as the covenant of Deuteronomy. Really? That brings up an interesting question because 
as I have read through the Bible, I know years ago I struggled to read through the Bible in chronological order, Genesis, Exodus, of course Leviticus, I know where that belongs yeah. now after, <laughs> after Exodus 32. We come to the book of Numbers, but then the last of the five books of Moses in the Pentateuch, Deuteronomy. I, I come to Deuteronomy and I'm not sure what to, what to do with Deuteronomy. Where does Deuteronomy fit into all of this? Deuteronomy is the most important and quite possibly the least understood book of the Pentateuch, the five it. books of Moses. But in addition, it really is sort of like the linchpin that holds the Pentateuch uh, to the rest of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Uh, now, how it does that isn't always clear. It takes many readings, and it's taken me years and years of study, and especially immersing myself in the early fathers, in many of the ancient rabbinic sources as well, because there you'll find that Deuteronomy is not just a repetition of the law. Mm -hmm. It is, as the name Deuteronomy implies, a second law. A second law. That's what Deuteronomy means. Yeah, Deuteros is second, Namas is the word okay. for law. So it's a second law. It isn't just a second telling of the law. Mm. You look at the law and the covenant made between God and Israel at Sinai 40 years earlier, and then you look at the covenant of Deuteronomy made on the plains of Moab 40 years later. This one was made with the first generation. This one is made with the second generation. This one was made by God speaking through the lightning and the thunder and the fire. This one is made, Deuteronomy is made, without a single peep coming from God. No fire, no thunder, no lightning. Instead, the Deuteronomy covenant is a long oration given by Moses on the plains of Moab immediately after the second generation has committed apostasy. And so the second law, the second covenant made with the second generation is really made by Moses acting on God's behalf, but it suggests, as many scholars have noticed, an even greater distance between God and his family. Mm -hmm. And so Deuteronomy affirms the status that Israel enjoys as God's firstborn son. In fact, Deuteronomy affirms that more than any other book in the Old Testament, but in the midst of affirming Israel's sonship, divine sonship, Deuteronomy does more to describe Israel as a rebellious and wayward son who has to be treated by the father like a master treats a slave, which really fits with a lot of modern scholarship because modern scholars have noticed that the Deuteronomy covenant fits almost perfectly with the ancient treaty patterns that are found in many of the archaeological digs of the century. Covenant treaties that were made between masters and slave states or slave nations. They follow almost the identical pattern found in the book of Deuteronomy, hmm. suggesting that God the Father has to now hmm. act as though he has to take on the role of Israel's master, taskmaster, mm -hmm. whereas Israel, the son of God, almost becomes like the slave of God. Sounds like a demotion. It really is. It's a probation state where a lot of the privileges are taken away and a lot of difficult conditions are imposed upon the second generation and then the third and the fourth and the fifth. And when you look at Deuteronomy, you're going to see many distinctive features in these laws that you're never going to find in the laws that have been given at Mount Sinai 40 years earlier. It's really worth spending a few minutes of our time together looking at those two, I think. So you're saying that the laws, well, first of all, you're saying that the covenant that took place at Sinai with the first generation is different than the covenant at Moab with the second generation 40 years later, and that the laws in Deuteronomy are different than the laws at Sinai. Exactly. In fact, Deuteronomy itself really points us to that conclusion. In Deuteronomy 29, verse 1, we read, These are the words of the covenant which the Lord commanded Moses to make with the people of Israel in the land of Moab, besides the covenant which hmm. he had made with them at Horeb, or Sinai. That word besides is kind of important, isn't it? It sure is, <laughs> yeah. And you notice that at Sinai, God was speaking. God was ever-present and active, even when he had to distance himself from his rebellious people. But in Deuteronomy, there is no theophany, no appearance or manifestation of God. There are just, just very long sermons delivered by Moses there in the heat of the plains of Moab hmm. right after the apostasy of Baal Peor. So what are these distinctive laws that you find in Deuteronomy but you don't find earlier at Sinai? 
That, I think, is the question that we really need to consider to see the function of Deuteronomy as it sets the stage, as it sets the historical program for Israel over the next several centuries, in fact, over the next 13 or 14 centuries until the coming of Christ. Because in Deuteronomy, you see certain concessions being made, not directly by God, but instead indirectly. God allows Moses to become the primary lawgiver in Deuteronomy. There is no divine voice. Moses is the only one speaking. He is the one delivering the laws. So you're saying that the covenant is between Moses and the people, but God is sort of standing back and saying that I'm behind this, but I'm not directly involved. Exactly. Uh, God would be saying, here is my representative, Moses, and I send him to you to make a covenant on my behalf, and then the people might look to the Levites as their representatives, as the mediator between the covenant that Moses is promulgating here with them. Well, what kind of, law, what kind of laws in Deuteronomy are we talking about? Well, there are certain concessions. You know, St. Thomas Aquinas describes how the, the wise and prudent lawgiver has to assess the, the moral condition of the people so he doesn't erect a legal standard impossibly high. And so Moses, as a wise and prudent lawgiver, starts to tolerate certain evils in Deuteronomy that were not officially condoned anywhere in the Sinai legislation. Uh, St. Thomas describes how the wise lawgiver must tolerate lesser evils in order to avoid greater evils. Hmm. He must regulate those, in fact. And so only in Deuteronomy 24, verses 1 to 4, does Moses, not God, but does Moses allow divorce because of the hardness of Israel's heart. Just exactly like Jesus says there in, uh, in, in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 12. Thanks. So, divorce and remarriage is one example of a law that is only found in this concessionary body of laws called Deuteronomy. Likewise, usury, or interest. Uh, the Hebrew word neshek for interest or usury literally means bite, hmm. because interest, usury, is understood as taking a bite out of the person that you loan money to. In the Sinai legislation, you weren't allowed, there's nothing about usury as such. In Deuteronomy it says, you can't charge usury of a fellow Israelite, but you can charge usury from Gentiles, from non-Israelites. That points to another effect, another distinctive feature of Deuteronomy's covenant law, that is its isolationist effect. It has the effect of isolating, uh, quarantining God's Son from all of the Gentiles because God realizes that Israel's holiness is a much weaker spiritual force now than the sinfulness of the Gentile nations, even though God the Father has in mind Israel the firstborn son going out to those Gentile nations and ministering truth and righteousness to them. But he realizes Israel is more tempted to be like the nations than they are drawn to, uh, more, they're more tempted to be like the nations than they are to draw the nations back to God. Uh, there's a lot more that can be said, but why don't we just take a break right here and come back in a minute and look more specifically at some of the other distinctive features of the covenant law of Deuteronomy. Sounds good. Welcome back to our Father's Plan. We're in the midst of a very stimulating conversation with Dr. Scott Hahn. We're right in the middle of the book of Deuteronomy, and we're going to continue right where we left off. Let's talk about the book of Deuteronomy and how that differs from the covenant at Sinai. Yeah, I think we need to elaborate on some of the, the distinctive features that are only found in the Deuteronomy covenant, just so we'll understand how that Deuteronomy covenant functions as the constitution, the political constitution for the nation of Israel from this time all the way until the coming of Christ, because that's really what Deuteronomy represents to Israel. What, you know, you, you can compare the Sinai Covenant 40 years earlier to the Deuteronomy Covenant 40 years later to the, uh, the Declaration of Independence and the American Constitution, just as the Declaration of Independence broke us from England, but didn't make us a nation. 
the American Constitution is really what constituted us as a nation and gave us our political rules, so to speak. Likewise, the Sinai Covenant broke Israel from the idolatry and the bondage under Egypt. But it wasn't until the Deuteronomic Covenant that you really find the constitutional polity or program for Israel's social structures. We see other unique laws there besides some of the concessionary ones we've mentioned, such as divorce and usury. You also see permanent slavery instituted in Deuteronomy. You also see Moses allowing the Israelite males to marry foreign wives and take multiple wives from the nations as concubines, something that you never find at Sinai, and something, I should add, that you never find in the priestly legislation. You see, the laws that are given to the Levites in Leviticus, are a, th th those laws constitute a higher and holier standard for the clergy in Israel and the lower law that is given for the, the 12 lay tribes here in the book of Deuteronomy. I also mentioned this isolationist policy that really runs throughout the book of Deuteronomy. That Deuteronomy gives to, you can understand Deuteronomy as, as God grounding his rebellious son. I identify with that. <laughs> I think we all do. Uh, he puts Israel on the land and only there with a lot of new laws and a lot of stern warnings. And when they go into the land, there are certain laws that will take effect according to Deuteronomy that once again were never revealed or stipulated at Sinai. For instance, we have harem warfare. Harem is the Hebrew word for the ban. Back at Sinai, all God said to Israel about the Canaanite population was, you can't enter into covenants with them, you can't marry their women. Now, that's one thing. That's somewhat isolationist, but that's not the same thing as you go into the promised land that I swore to give to Abraham's seed, which you are, and you slaughter all of the Canaanite men, women, and children. That's not something that God says. That's not something that Moses wants. That's something that Moses concedes, is in this, effect. This is what the ban is, harem warfare? Exactly. In Deuteronomy, you see a totally different policy being tolerated by Moses than what was stipulated by God at Sinai. At Sinai, it's you avoid covenants with them. Mm -hmm. Now, it's one thing to avoid a covenant with a population. It's another thing to exterminate them. <laughs> in Deuteronomy, you exterminate them. Why? Well, because they're on our land. They They've taken our property. That belongs to us as the rightful heirs. Now, when it comes to this kind of issue, you know, suppose I return home from Birmingham and I discover a motorcycle gang has taken over my house and my wife and my five kids are their prisoners. Now, I might begin trying to use moral persuasion to influence and convince them to come out and let me have my home back and my wife and kids. But if they won't, because I can't convince them to, then what would I be allowed to do under normal moral standards? Well, I would, I would be morally permitted to use whatever force is necessary to reacquire what is my own by right. In effect, this is how Moses can justifiably tolerate this sort of law regarding harem warfare as you find it, for instance, in Deuteronomy 13. But you're not saying that this was the ideal. Oh, no. The ideal is, is implied back at Sinai, that as you go into the land and you don't make covenants with them through their gods, instead the ideal would be through your own holiness, mm -hmm. through the truth of my law, through the power that you will acquire by living out the truth of my law, you'll convert them. You'll draw them yeah. into a desire to be like you. Yeah. And so the Canaanites will come into covenants through the God of Israel. That would have been the ideal program. But 40 years later, Israel's mm. spiritual condition is too weak. Their, their holiness is no match for the sinfulness right. of, the, of the Canaanites. You know, this is such an interesting point that you're bringing up here right now, because I know that you have had people to come and talk to you before. People have come and talked to me before, and they said, you know, I read the Bible, the Old Testament, and I don't see how the God of the Old Testament is the same as the God of the New Testament. And how could a good God go and do all of these things? And this answers that. Exactly, exactly. And it also helps us to explain something that we've already begun to, to study, and that is, why does God require animal sacrifice? I mean, in pagan religions, the deities have a certain vile bloodlust. They, they will grant temporal favors only in exchange for blood mm -hmm. and burnt flesh and this sort of thing. Now obviously the God of Israel is not interested in that sort of thing. So why then does God require Israel to slaughter these animals? 
Well, the Pentateuch implies it. The rabbis picked it up, the early church fathers, the medieval doctors down through the ages. We have it if we want it. The answer is simple. Because the animals that God required Israel to sacrifice were the animals that Israel had been secretly worshiping along with the Egyptians during their 400 year stay in Egypt. And so one slaughter episode wasn't enough. In Exodus 24, they revert back to the golden calf, to the worship of bulls, and so it becomes a daily requirement. But what's interesting is this. During the 40 years under the law given at Sinai after the golden calf, every animal you wanted to eat for dinner, you had to take to the tabernacle and have a Levite slaughter in a sacred way. In Deuteronomy, there is a distinctive law found, for instance, in Deuteronomy 12 and 15 and elsewhere that's only found in Deuteronomy. There is an allowance or provision granted by God for the profane slaughter of animals. In other words, the 12 tribes, when they get into the Promised Land, are going to be too far away from the central sanctuary mm -hmm. to bring all of their carnivorous meals to the Levites. There's just no practical way to do that. And so all of the animals that you want to eat, you can slaughter with one important exception, the firstlings of your flocks and herds. According to Deuteronomy 12 and 15, you have to set aside all of the firstborn, cattle, sheep, and goats, all of the firstlings from your uh, flocks and herds, and keep them, and then bring them to the central sanctuary three times a year for the Feast of Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. You're not allowed to eat the firstlings. You could eat all the other ones. This again is another distinctive law that is only found in Deuteronomy. That is the sacrifice of the firstlings. And I've already mentioned another, yet another distinctive law. That is the central sanctuary. You see, only in Deuteronomy chapter 12 does God, or I should say Moses, acting as God's representative, say that when you get into the promised land and you have defeated all your enemies, and you don't just have rest in the land, but you have rest from all your enemies round about you, in other words, all the surrounding nations are now subdued and they're subordinate to your political authority, when all that has happened because God has graced you, then you must seek out the place where God has chosen for his name to dwell and build him a sanctuary there and only there shall you bring your sacrifices. The place. The place. It's never specifically said what place. But apparently they knew what place it was. It was Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. And it was fulfilled later on, of course, in David's time, as we'll see. But this distinctive Deuteronomic law of the central sanctuary really becomes the hinge of the entire Deuteronomic covenant and the focal point of all of ancient Israel's subsequent history. In just a short amount of time, all the attention is going to slowly swing over to the conquest of the Promised Land and the acquisition of Jerusalem and the erection of the Temple by Solomon. Say that again, because I think that that's important. Yeah, it really is. You're, you're saying that all of the attention is going to be focused on the place. Yeah, the place Jerusalem. which the Lord God has chosen for His name to dwell. The dwelling place of God's name will be the Temple. Okay. Now, that is the only place Israel can bring sacrifices once it's built. But up until the time it's built, the specific uh, conditions found in Deuteronomy 12 aren't met. In other words, the central sanctuary was not supposed to be built, and the exclusive sacrifice of animals there and only there was not to be institutionalized until Israel had been given by God rest from all the enemies round about. That's more than the rest that Joshua uh, uh, gained for Israel in defeating the enemies in the Promised Land. The rest is really what David accomplishes by subduing and colonizing all the nations that surround Israel. So here we have certain concessionary laws in Deuteronomy. Here we also have certain laws that make up the constitution of Israel as a nation state. We have another law too. We have kingship. Only in Deuteronomy 17 does God, acting through his representative Moses, give an official allowance for the institution of secular monarchy or kingship. Because at this point we don't have a king in Israel. That's right. We, we have kings in a sense, but they're priestly kings or they're priest kings. Mm -hmm. And that's what all of Israel was supposed to be. But here we're talking about secular kingship. So Deuteronomy 17 ultimately is going to constitute Israel not just as any old nation, 
but as a kingdom, mm -hmm. as a dynastic empire, according to the laws of Deuteronomy 17. But even there, Moses stipulates that it can't be a foreigner. It has to be one from among your own brethren who will reign as king. So in all of these ways, Deuteronomy gives certain laws to Israel that represent their probationary stay in the promised land. One last thing I have to add, though, because Deuteronomy's got another feature that is really ominous. That is the prophetic element in Deuteronomy. Beginning in 27, going all the way to the end in Deuteronomy 34, there is a very ominous prophetic note being sounded. Back earlier at Sinai, Leviticus 26 had listed all kinds of punishments that would come upon Israel if they sinned, if they sinned. But in Deuteronomy 27 to 34, we have something else being given by Moses. It's no longer a, if you disobey, then you'll be cursed. In Deuteronomy 27, Israel comes under a curse in an official ceremony whereby the Deuteronomic covenant is ratified. That's described in Deuteronomy 27. Then the specific curses are elaborated in excruciating detail in Deuteronomy 28 mm -hmm. for over 50 verses. Uh, just uh, hair-raising curses are described. Cannibalism, slavery, it just, it, 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 it's mind-boggling. That's in 28. Then in 29 and 30, you discover in 29, the reason why those curses are going to befall Israel. In Deuteronomy 29, verse 4, Moses tells Israel, up until this time, you've had eyes, but you've not been able to see. Because you don't have eyes to see, you don't have ears to hear, you don't have a heart to understand. Well, why not? How can Moses say that Israel doesn't have the eyes to see or the ears to hear or the mind to understand the law of God? Well, they have not because they've asked not. They don't have a heart for the Lord, not because God has withheld it, but because they have not sought it. They have, no, they have not felt any need to have circumcised hearts, to have new minds, to be given spiritual eyes and supernatural ears. And so because they're putting all their trust in their own natural powers, they don't have within themselves the capacity to keep the law and, and, and to attain holiness. And so the curses are revealed in 28. The reason for the curses are revealed in 29. And then the inevitability of those curses is announced in chapter 30. It's no longer a question of, well, if you do this, then you'll be cursed. In Deuteronomy 30, it's more like when you've disobeyed mm. and you wake up as slaves in a foreign land to which you've been exiled, and exile is the ultimate form that the curse takes. Mm. When you wake up as exiles and strangers and slaves in a foreign land, and you call to mind all these laws and all the curses that Moses had predicted, then you'll cry out to me, and in verse 10, God promises that at that time, sometime off in the distant future, I will circumcise your hearts. I will cause you, I will empower you, so that you will finally be able to keep the laws that you agreed to, but then you subsequently disobeyed. So the Deuteronomic covenant has the practical, historical effect of putting Israel under a bunch of covenant curses, culminating in a protracted period of exile for the nation. Now, you might think, this is, this is just, uh, this seals their fate, but it seals their redemption too. This announces their doom, but it announces their salvation because at the end of the long period of exile, God says, you will cry out to me, and I will establish a new covenant. I will circumcise your heart. In Deuteronomy 10, God said, circumcise your own hearts, which they couldn't do. In Deuteronomy 30, he says, at that time, off in the distant future, I will circumcise your hearts. Interesting. I will give you a new covenant. John Paul II made a statement in Veritatis Splendor, quoting St. Augustine, that I think does a marvelous job of summarizing this whole perspective of how Deuteronomy is a temporary probationary covenant for Israel. He said, quoting St. Augustine, that the law was given to Israel by God so that they would seek grace. Hmm. Because apart from grace, you can't keep the law. The law was given so that grace might be sought. Then grace is given 
so that the law might finally be obeyed. You know, this makes so much sense. It brings up a question that, that I have. You know, we, we read a lot in the New Testament, and the Apostle Paul it seems to always be talking about the law. And there's always that debate. Did the law is done away with. Was the law good? Was the law bad? The law was a tutor. We get this idea that the law was uh, sort of dismissed at this point in the New Testament. What law is Paul talking about? Is he talking about Sinai or is Paul talking about this idea that you've introduced here, uh, the Deuteronomic Covenant. Yeah, and I would, I would suggest to you that that question puts us back on the right track, a track that we've been off in biblical studies for a long time. But the church fathers and the medieval doctors, up until the last century or two, the, the, the majority report was, was this, that the, that the moral law revealed and summarized in the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, is of course still abiding mm -hmm. and still authoritative. But all of the laws that were given after the golden calf as a temporary remedy for their sin. At Sinai. At Sinai. And then all of the laws that became a permanent institution with the Deuteronomic Covenant, those laws, the central sanctuary in Jerusalem, the sacrifice of the firstborn animals, the institution of earthly kingship, the allowance of divorce and remarriage, the permission for usury, and on and on, those are the laws that the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 dispensed Christians from. It is that law which Paul argues in Romans and especially in Galatians as that which Christ has, uh, in, a, in a sense, broken, out of, broken us free from, as it were. And this is something that is already programmed in the Old Testament, especially you'll find it in Ezekiel 20. In Ezekiel 20, verses 18 to 26, the prophet summarizes the laws of the Deuteronomic Covenant in a remarkable way. I, I don't have the time to get into all of this, but in Deuteronomy 20, verses, uh, really we could begin in verse uh, 23 and following. You mean Ezekiel? I'm sorry, yes. Ezekiel 20, verse 23. It describes how God swears an oath whereby Israel will be exiled until the Messiah comes. He also gave them statutes that were not good and ordinances by which they could not have life, and he made them offer all their animals, all their firstlings. Why? Because by this probationary covenant of Deuteronomy, he would finally show his people that apart from me you can do nothing, that in my flesh there lies no good thing. I need God to circumcise my heart. I need a new covenant. So in effect, Deuteronomy is a self-retiring covenant that ultimately points to and gives way to the new covenant that Christ establishes. It's an internal covenant written not upon stone tablets, but written upon our hearts. This is such an important part of our legacy as Catholic Christians to dive into the Bible, to understand how through baptism and especially through the Holy Eucharist, we have the sacramental means to keep the law Grace does not make law-keeping easy. Grace makes keeping the commandments possible. Keeping the law of God has always been necessary to keeping the family covenant that binds us. But now, and only now through the Holy Spirit, the power of our Father, the Spirit of Sonship, can we walk in the family ways of our Father. By circumcised hearts, we are empowered to keep the law of God. That's something we ought to be thankful for. That's something we should be attentive to. That's something that we should be studying and sharing with many other people as well. I'm convinced that if we go back and retrieve this lost tradition that is really part of our legacy and heritage as Catholics, from the fathers and the medieval doctors there in the Bible, we will have an ability to make the Bible come alive as you describe it, to be a family heirloom for all believers. That's beautiful. We're out of time now, but we could go on and on. Thanks be to God for the, for the inspired scriptures. Okay. Say